I've always been a huge wuss when it comes to horror films, probably ever since I was about seven and my brothers made me watch Predator on VHS with them. And I had nightmares for like the next 15 years or so. But I have gotten braver over the decades since, thanks to exposure therapy. Uh, But at the start, things were pretty rough. I remember swinging by a used DVD store and seeing Shaun of the Dead. And I thought, okay, it's a comedy, not a horror movie. It's like Young Frankenstein, RIP to the Queen, Terry Gar. So cool. I can totally handle that, right? Let's go. So I got it. And let me tell you, it was a horror. It's a horror movie. I was very scared. Um, Not to drop any spoilers on a 20 year old movie, but I don't care how unlikable a character is. I still got really grossed out (laughs) and freaked out watching zombies rip through his torso and pull his entrails out and eat them. It was disturbing. But it turns out that research suggests I was probably right to start my exposure therapy journey with a comedy horror instead of a horror horror. Uh, That's right. For the second year in a row, we're going to celebrate Halloween by talking about a study from those freaks over at the Recreational Fear Lab. In case you missed it, last October, I talked about research that categorized people based on how and why they enjoy spooky movies and experiences. That study was done by researchers at Aarhus University in Denmark, where psychologists established a lab, the Recreational Fear Lab, specifically focused on studying fear. Why do we experience fear? Why do many of us seek it out? What are the benefits of fear? The Fear Lab study I'd like to talk about today is about the relationship between humor and fear. First they scream, then they laugh. The Cognitive Intersections of Humor and Fear was published back in June in Evolution psychology. And yes, I know that usually on this channel, when I talk about evolutionary psychology studies, it's to point out how terrible they are. But in this case, the authors don't create any just so stories about our ancestors on the savanna with zero evidence. In fact, they explicitly point out in their study that they're not claiming that humor evolves specifically or exclusively to manage human fears, but only that it represents a widely employed and effective means of doing so. So yeah, instead they discuss the research that points to an essential relationship between fear and humor, despite their opposite effects on our minds and our bodies. For instance, fear is an emotion that appears to help us when we're confronted with a threat. It comes with a set of physiological effects that aid us in our fight or flight response, like an increase in adrenaline and mental focus on the threat. Similarly, humor seems to be rooted in play. A lot of research suggests that human laughter actually evolved for a similar reason as why my dog sneezes when we're in the middle of play fighting, to signal that, hey, we're just goofing around here. You know, we're just playing. We're not really fighting. Play fighting helps us and dogs and many other animals prepare for future threats in a safe environment. We learn how to wrestle and run and bite and kick, uh, but it isn't stressful because we're having fun. Instead of that stress, you know, that fear response gives us, uh, instead we get a boost in those pleasant hormones. We feel more relaxed and happy. The researchers say that that type of play is called a benign violation. Normally a violation would provoke a fear reaction, but once we realize that it's benign, we get that humor reaction. The researchers illustrate this by discussing various situations where humor and fear intersect, starting with the first funny, scary thing that most of us ever experience in our lives, peekaboo. This is a game played all across the world, across many cultures, and while there are slight variations, every version always includes a parent making eye contact with their baby, then hiding or covering their face, then reappearing and exclaiming a usually nonsensical word in a high-pitched, happy voice. So the first time you do this, apparently the baby is genuinely freaked out. 
It's a jump scare, which the authors point out is probably deeply embedded in our brains and the brains of many other animals as a pretty basic way to respond to something quickly that's potentially dangerous. But when the parent laughs and smiles and coos, the baby quickly learns this is not an actual scary situation. And as the game is replayed over and over again, the baby learns the violation is always benign, and they start to laugh along with the parent to return that signal that, hey, we're just playing, and social bonding happens. Next, the researchers move on to scare pranks, like jumping out of a closet to scare your sibling. Funny enough, this kind of benign violation is also done by animals other than humans, with cats probably being the most common prankster. You might see lying in wait and jumping out to scare a litter mate or even to scare their pet human uh, and then running off. The researchers had a panel of judges evaluate 100 scare prank YouTube videos and found that 76 of them featured at least one victim who expressed enjoyment afterward, although they still had a slight majority that featured at least one victim who was upset and hated it. This is because a large majority of YouTube prank videos suck and are also fake. That's my opinion, not the researchers. The researchers found that only about a quarter of the videos were fake, and they made no comment on how much they sucked. As an aside, despite my obvious hatred of social media prank videos, I am very good at scare pranks. Back in my 20s, I lived with a boyfriend who also enjoyed such shenanigans, and one night I pretended to leave the apartment to go hang out with friends, but I secretly went back into the bedroom and I hid under the covers of the bed, and when he came to bed later, I jumped up and grabbed him and really freaked him out. But then the next night, I did the exact same thing. I pretended to leave. I went back in. But instead of hiding under the covers, I shoved some clothes under the covers. And then I hid under the bed. And I waited for him to come to bed. And when he did, he assumed I was hiding under the bed covers. So he jumped on the bed to scare me. But then he realized that I was not under the covers. And he got really confused and stepped off the bed, at which point I grabbed his ankles and screamed as loud as I could. And then he screamed as loud as he could. And then we got in trouble with the apartment management. Anyway, next the researchers looked at jump scares, like in a movie when the monster suddenly appears, or even in a haunted house when a monster suddenly appears. Past research shows that in the vast majority of cases, people who get scared at haunted houses laugh immediately afterward. The researchers here point out that some of those reactions may be genuine laughter, stemming from the realization that the situation is benign, but others may actually be doing a nervous laughter as a signal to try to make the situation benign, a form of appeasement. They also point out that jump scares in haunted houses and in films particularly destroy whatever immersion was happening. You know, you you forget you're watching a really good film when you're immersed in it and you're just getting those creepy vibes. And then bam, jump scare. And suddenly you remember you're in a theater with a bunch of people and that releases tension and you all laugh together and it makes the situation a social bonding experience. And that leads to the fourth example of horror comedy, right? Where I started my own journey towards embracing horror as a genre. In this case, the authors explore how distance, both physical distance and psychological distance, can determine whether something is scary scary or funny scary. They illustrate this by comparing Frankenstein, the movie from 1931 starring Boris Karloff, to Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein from 1944 starring Glenn Strange wearing the exact same costume and makeup as Karloff and doing the exact same movements. Despite the similarity of the characters, the distance is completely different. From a psychological standpoint, the characters in Karloff's film react to him realistically as though he truly is a monster they're afraid of. The film also spends a lot of time setting up Dr. Frankenstein as a real scientific genius who could really create this creature. These aspects draw the audience closer to the characters and immerses them more deeply in the story, which makes the story scarier. But there's also a difference between these two films in spatial distance. 
The researchers broke down how many long shots, medium shots, and close-ups were used in each film and found that the comedy had significantly more long shots compared to the horror, which utilized close-ups and extreme close-ups to literally close the distance between the audience and the monster and making him much scarier. Finally, the researchers discussed the use of humor in allaying our fears. For instance, some visitors to haunted houses prefer to minimize their fear. Others prefer to maximize it. But in this case, they focused on the people who were minimizing their fear. And in surveys, those people said things like, we just laughed a little and made funny comments to each other while we walked through, or I just smiled the whole way through. And even, I think I tried to keep an ironic distance to see it as humorous. So again, distance, psychologically, it helps make things less scary. The researchers also discussed the use of fear as a kind of therapy, and I talked a bit about that in that previous video. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check that out. So I know this isn't the most groundbreaking study I've talked about, but I do enjoy learning more about why we enjoy creeping ourselves out. If you enjoyed this too, then please let me know in the comments. Drop a recommendation for the best horror film that you've seen this year. Because, you know, spooky season isn't quite over for me yet. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you loved the video, please subscribe. And if you think the world could use more videos like this and you happen to have a few bucks laying around, head to patreon.com slash Rebecca and join an awesome community of nerds like the people whose names you see on the screen right now. Thanks.